That's Facebook. So I just turned my mic on. Let's make sure I'm going through. Oh, yeah, that camera. Well, that, why does that sound so weird right now? All right. Do you hear that? How that sounds? Is that just because I'm behind a monitor or what? I just got on here for the Facebook crowd. We'll be live here in about 10 minutes. I don't know if you can see me or not. Keep talking. I'm going to see if I can hear you. Okay. We're doing some sound checks. We're trying to get all of the technology worked out. Oh, look. Everything's good. Hi, oh, Dad. It's Cayman. Say hi to everybody, Cayman. Hi. Hi. <laughs> we coming through? We got a stream? <sighs> Is everything awesome? We're there? You know, so if you're out on Facebook land and you have already logged on uh, and you're watching, we'll go live here. The service will start here in about five minutes, I think. Just, uh, you know, make some comments. If you have any um, problems hearing anything, if you can hear me right now, maybe you should comment. Are we getting any comments through there? You can open the comment bar. I'll be back in a sec. Uh, you can click on that little uh, thing and all the Facebook comments will come up. So if you move the mouse over here, there it is, and click on that comment icon, there's the Facebook people. Okay. Oh, I didn't know, realize you were on. Okay, good deal. Okay, good deal. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, we're, I'm going to step off here, but thanks for tuning in. We will be ready to go in a minute. Okay.
Welcome to Ordinary Faith. I know the time says you got three minutes, but nah, we started that late. But so welcome, because if you were expecting church all done up right, I'm sure they're meeting somewhere. We just welcome you to our family. If it's your first time, welcome. If it's your last time, I'm sorry. If you have been here before, then you know that we just are here to worship God. And I invite you to stand and sing with us. If you want to sing, sing along. If you want to watch, enjoy but welcome to church today welcome to ordinary faith it's a great day to be in the house of the lord right Amen. let's be honest it's a great day to be anywhere so we'll take the house of the lord and let's celebrate jesus this morning sing with us <laughs>
<clears throat> um, thank you, Father God, for this morning. Thank you for your incredible love for us. Thank you, Lord, that we're together. Uh, please protect. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you just banish fear uh, and foolishness too, Lord. Not that we need that, but we do. And uh, I pray that when we walk out of this place, we walk out of here following Jesus more intently than we ever have. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You guys can have a seat. Um, I'm, I'm going to be slightly distracted here just for a second while I fix a tech thing and off we go. <clears throat> Thanks, worship team. Great job. Yeah. Okay, so before I get going, uh, as tech team, streamers, are we good? Everything's working. It's a miracle. All right. Uh, maybe not. Hannah? Okay. Am I? Oh, there we go. You did that? So, can I do that? Oh, this is great. It's got to be a challenge somewhere. <clears throat> Might have to pray again. <laughs> Won't be a harm in that at all, uh, Miss Sally. Need to do that. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, jumping into our last message in this Killing It series, and Shazam. There it is. Okay. Um, thank you. I apologize for the technology issues. We're just having them, and there's not a thing I can do about it. Uh, today's message, the title is, What If We Obey Jesus? Now, um... So I'm going to get started here, and I, this isn't meant to beat anybody up. I just want a reality check kind of thing, all right? So uh, I, you know me, I like to be encouraging as much as I can. Um, but I've had some, uh, through this ordeal, I had to do some thinking um, about where we are as a church, where, uh, what the future holds. Uh, I don't know if you read the Bible much or not, I sure hope you do. Jesus had a lot to say about how things were going to go in this world. And there's a book in the Bible called Revelation in which Jesus kind of reveals what the Father revealed to him. And uh, although I believe there are principles and applications at any time period for the church in all of those messages, uh, there's just some things that I think that, that Christians need to prepare for. And so um, I have no interest in running a hospice church to watch evangelism and evangelicalism and faith die in America. That's not my interest. My interest is to see the cause of Christ, the gospel of Jesus, the word of God, grow exponentially in America. <clears throat> the most significant revival on earth in this moment is happening in Iran in Iran, the, the nation that's the greatest threat to Israel is experiencing a discipleship-making movement comparable to what has happened in China over the last 30 or 40 years. They're seeing a similar thing happen in India, but it looks very different from what we do in church in America today. And so if I could just bore you with a few statistics, are you okay with that? Yeah. All right, you can sleep now, tune in later when I get into the Word, Okay. <laughs> Uh, there's a book that came out called The Great Evangelical Recession written by uh, John Dickerson, who's a pastor at Cornerstone Church in Prescott, Arizona. And he began to evaluate where evangelicals are in the country today. Now, evangelicals are supposed to statistically represent 40% of the United States of America. 40%. However, if you add in two little criteria, the criteria that you believe that the Bible's the Word of God without error... And the criteria that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ, that 40% drops down to below 10% of America, okay? Evangelicalism, or even evangelism, I guess, but it, it, it's been on decline all of my life. Uh, since the 50s, since the evangelistic outbreaks of the 50s, we've been on decline. We're in a country that's experiencing an amazing population and immigration growth, 
and Christendom is shrinking inside of that. We're growing like crazy, but our churches are dwindling. And sadly, we're not even reaching our own kids. We are, uh, we are sending out a millennial generation, and there are more atheists and secularists in that generation than there are Christ followers, even leaving the church. And so uh, I don't like that. I, I don't like that. Okay. <laughs> that makes, it, it makes me angry. It, it, it makes me question things. In the book Spent Matches by Roy Moran, he, he, uh, they did some studies. He cited some studies. In the Western world, when I say Western world, I'm talking about everybody on the planet who kind of lives like we do. Europe, America, just the Western thinking. In the Western world, if you broke down how much money churches spend and divided it by the number of people that we baptize as converts, the number you would get is that it costs between $750,000 and $1.5 million to baptize one convert to Christianity the way we're doing it. Does that, does that make anybody else kind of throw up a little bit in the back of your throat? <laughs> $1.5 that's just crazy. And, and, you know, I look at Ordinary Faith, I'm going, we've never even taken in that much money. But then I realize how many volunteer hours, how, how much we do every week, how much you do every week, the investments we make. If you turn that into a dollar, no telling how much it would be for every person we baptize. Now, What's a soul worth? I know that's what you're thinking. It is worth whatever you have to pay for any soul. However, if there was a better way, and Jesus already showed us what it was, then I, I would be interested, right? <laughs> and so, today, I, I'm talking about what if we obey Jesus. I already said I have no interest in running hospice for Christendom in America. Challenges are always complex, right? Right? Like, you ever had a financial problem, and maybe you lost a job, or maybe whatever, and you started looking at your bills, and you look at all the problems, and it, it's complex. However, the solution tends to be simple, right? So if you have a financial problem, you know the, the simplicity of the situation is, is that every month you're spending more than you make. So the simplicity of the problem is that every month you spend less than you make. Simple. I didn't say easy. Simple, easy, not same thing. Not the same thing. I just said simple. And it's the same way with this problem in America, this problem with Christendom, with evangelism and evangelicalism in the country. There is, I believe, there is a simple solution. And I think the solution is presented by Jesus Christ and it's as simple as what, we talk, what we're going to talk about today. As we raise the question, what if instead of uh, pursuing Christianity and the Bible for knowledge, what if we pursued it for obedience? What if rather than coming into a Sunday school class or a small group and, and feeling like, oh cool, I learned something, or coming to a Sunday morning and go, oh man, he really taught me something today, what if we left with an idea of like, okay, how can I take what I've learned today and follow Jesus with it? How can I do it? How can I do it? So, let's jump into the text, okay? Call the Great Commission. I'm going to read the verse just before what we call the Great Commission because it never gets read, so I thought you should hear it. Out of the New Living Translation, Matthew 28, 17. When they saw him, well, who are they? Well, these are the disciples, probably the 120 that are going to end up in the room. Anyway, they're all there on the mount with Jesus. He's getting ready to jet on out of here, jet blue style. No, I'm just kidding. When they saw him, they worshipped him. And if you have a way to underline this next phrase, you should do it. Because there's a phrase here that says, But some of them doubted. Bam! What does that tell you? Man, I'm telling you, when you read the Bible, don't just go, oh yeah, there, it's there. Go, what is this saying? What does this mean? Jesus is standing there. He had just been crucified, beaten to a bloody pulp 40 days before and now he's about to ascend, and his disciples are looking at him. And some of them are going, I don't know if it's real. Uh, maybe. Maybe he's the Messiah. Peter's like, dude, he rode from the dead. <sighs> and he can still fish, but that's another time. <laughs> 
So Jesus came and told his disciples. Here's, here it is, the Great Commission. I have been given all authority in heaven on earth and on earth. Jesus has been given all authority. Jesus. Therefore, to his disciples, and by extension to every Christian that would become a follower of Jesus through them, all the way to you right here sitting in this room, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There it is, guys. The mandate for every believer. Yet We could say the mandate of the church, but Jesus did not say go out and, and build churches. He didn't say go out and plant churches. Jesus said go make disciples. He said he'd take care of the church part. And so that's our mandate. So I want to ask that question. Have you, ever, have you ever been a place in life where you knew something, you knew you knew something, which is a high level of consciousness, <laughs> but you didn't quite get what you knew? I know it, but I don't get it. Any parent knows this, right? You're trying to teach your children things, and you teach them the things, and they are doing the things, hating doing the things, and you know they don't get the things. They don't understand, Okay? This is where we begin. We need to realize that following Christ is more than knowing things, more than going to church. It's more than what's in your head. It's about what you actually do. The quote goes, education without application is just entertainment. And if I wanted to be a little bit rough today, I could jump into a passage in Isaiah where God criticizes the people for gathering in a similar setting as we do as the church, but it was really more entertainment for them than it was actually obeying God. And so, by the way, the kids are great. They're not going to bother me. I have eight of them. I love being the church family with the whole family together, okay? All right? So don't worry about the kids. <clears throat> this, this is how I like it. This is how it should be. I love it. So, <clears throat> have you ever... Um, so my wife, several years ago, she made a recipe book for our family. The Maynard family, eight sons, our, our story, we have, you can imagine, family recipes, all right? When you're feeding eight sons, by the way, that's like running a cafeteria. It's a lot more that than a family kind of gathering. So we have these recipes, you know? And so she made a recipe book for our kids in case they ever wanted one of the family recipes. And we got some from our, like, Christie's grand mothers and and her mom and those kind of things she put it together now I don't know about you but I can read a recipe and get hungry can can you do that and we got some family favorites like the crock pot pizza church potatoes oh yeah my wife makes a jalapeno cornbread that will just slap you in the face I say let him run but I guess I better not say that That'd be a lot of running. You know the ingredients, you know the possibilities. But here, to kind of put this in context, our favorite thing ever, well, maybe not ever, one of our favorite recipes is Christie's grandmother's coconut cake. I have, I have preached on this cake before. I mean, I love this cake, all right? It, it's, it's delicious. It, it, it's, it's the most wonderful. How many are you getting hungry? Just me talking about this delicious cake. But here's the thing about the cake. <clears throat> you read the recipe, you can, you can almost smell the last time you ate it, and you're like getting all in there. But, but here's the thing about Grandma's cake. We've made it, I don't know how many years. Is 10 times too high? Six times maybe? Last year is the first time we got it right. Last year. First time we got it right. The thing about a recipe is, you know, if it's a family recipe, if you really want it to taste like Grandma made it, it takes a while to get there. And that's the difference between information and application. Sometimes you know a thing, but until you apply the thing, do the thing, fail at the thing, get back and try it again, you're not, you're not going to make any progress. You're not going to learn the thing. You will know it and not get it. Does that make sense? 
This is why this is so important that we, even though sometimes we know things and we don't get them, we, we have to get in the Word. Oh, I'm going too slow. I have to go faster, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> so the Word of God, comparable to the recipes, is filled with these principles. Every Bible image in the Gospels is, princi- is a principle being presented. And I often refer to the story of Peter walking on the water because it's familiar, because I talk about it a lot. I can go back to it, use it again. So rinse, wash, repeat kind of thing. And in Peter's walking on the water, we see this uh, amazing principle set forth. And we're going to learn from Jesus right now. You, if you remember the setting of the story, the disciples are in a boat that's being swamped by a storm that's causing the sea to rage And they're scared. We can all identify with that, right? Jesus is out on the waves. Peter's, uh, whatever the conversation was, it comes to, hey, Jesus, if that's really you, invite me out there with you. Which is the dumbest question ever. (laughs) Jesus says, bring it. That's what it said in the Greek. (laughs) So, Peter without a single Sunday school class on water walking. But not even a visit from the pastor. Peter takes his foot and steps out on a raging sea. And you should make note, if you have a place to make note in your Bible, the storm did not stop just because Peter stepped out of the boat. You see, Peter had a choice. Terrified in the boat, terrified on the waves. Either way, terrified. One of those gets me closer to Jesus, though. Right? You're starting to see the principle now. Jesus begins to invite Peter into this journey toward him, and Peter takes that one step. And this, when we talk about obeying Jesus, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about taking steps out under raging seas. Not expecting the sea to calm down for only one reason, to get to Jesus. There's nothing awesome about walking on the water. I know you may argue with me. Peter's water walk was not awesome. What was awesome was Peter's focus on Christ that kept him on the water. Not impressive to walk on water, impressive to get close to God. Does that make a difference? Does that that help settle this a little bit for you? And so Jesus. Uh, So Peter got out there, and he obeyed Jesus, and he walked on water until he lost focus. So before I come back to Peter, let me jump off for this second. Everything Jesus tells you is good for you. He tells you to love your enemies. That's good for you. He tells you to forgive those who've hurt you. That's the best thing for you. Do you think Jesus is like, I think I'll just find the most difficult thing for them to do and just tell them to do that? No, he knows that as soon as you forgive someone who's hurt you, you're free. And he wants you to be free and walk in power. He knows that when you love your enemies, you not only are free from their uh, uh, cruelty and tyranny, you are also free to love them. You're free from the storm that you're in and you are now walking on the water. But here's the thing, everything he asks you to do is impossible. Walking on water is not something normal people do. But Jesus does, and his followers do too, as long as they are focused on Jesus. The issue of the water walk wasn't about walking on water, it was about the focus on Jesus. And here's here's how you walk on water. How to walk on water by Michael Maynard. (sighs) You're like, are you going to do demonstrations later? If someone will spill some water, I will do a demonstration. (laughs) You step onto a raging sea. You don't expect the sea to calm down just because you walked on it. Because your faith isn't in your circumstances. Your faith is in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So you take a step, and then you do the thing that Peter didn't do. You focus on Jesus. Because this is not about walking on water. It's about obeying Jesus. That's where the freedom comes. Step. Focus. Step, 
focus. You know what eventually happens if you step and focus and step and focus and step and focus? Sooner or later, you step in Jesus. Does that make sense? And that's what this life is. It's a walk on the raging sea home to peace. You're never going to have peace in this life outside of Christ. You know that, right? This world will never obey you. I think this is real Christianity in a nutshell. I think this is why obedience is so important. So Jesus Christ, we, we learn from him that it's about the application more than it is the information. The next thing I want to show you is that Jesus looked for the obedient, not the talented. John 14. I, I know some of you may be struggling with my discussion on obedience. And, and I just want to tell you, the issue of obedience is, is simply an issue of faith. When you trust Jesus, you trust that his ideas and words are more valuable than your own. Obedience doesn't save you. The blood of Jesus saves you. The resurrection of Christ saves you. Obedience is just evidence that you actually believe what he says. That's why he told his disciples, teach them to obey the things I've commanded you. Okay? So when Jesus came, he said this in John 14, 23. He said, all who love me will do what I say. All who love me will do what I say. You may need to wrestle with that. I have. All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love him, them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Jesus Christ invited many people to follow him. And you understand that not everybody did. Do you understand that? That we ended up with the 12, I mean several followed him, but there were the 12 that followed closely, that left all, that he chose to be the emissaries, the ambassadors, the apostles of the gospel of Christ into the world. And one of them failed. But you know what's really convicting to me about that? Even Judas left all to follow Jesus. Even Judas left everything to follow Jesus. Now here's the thing, and this could cause some some theological qualms, but that's okay, I like doing that. (sighs) Were they believers when Jesus called them? Or did they become believers later? Maybe that question doesn't throw you as much as it does me. First of all, there wasn't a gospel until Jesus rose from the dead, so they certainly didn't believe in any kind of new covenant type gospel. They might have believed Jesus was the Messiah, but what they did believe was somehow colored by the Judaism that they grew up in, the picture of the Messiah, which was why Judas left and betrayed Jesus Christ. And so Jesus invited these guys, and what did he say? Did he preach them? If you ever look for the the actual gospel as it's presented in an evangelical church in America today, in the Bible, you will not find it in in a single place contained together, by the way. Jesus said, here's how he invited them. He said, follow me. Just follow me. And so the four guys, uh, the the brothers and cousins and whatever, the fishermen, uh, Peter, James, John, Andrew, they left their nets and they followed Jesus. And, 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 And Matthew, the publican, the tax collector, the IRS agent, Jesus said, follow me. He gets up from his table. He follows Jesus. Their first act of faith was a simple act of obedience. And, and so then, here, think about it, what, their, what their journey looked like. Because they start out, Jesus didn't convert them. He said things like, tell them the kingdom's coming. Go out and uh, heal the sick. Run the demons out. Raise the dead. Tell me how that goes. Um, Hey, look, there's 5,000 people with no breakfast burritos. You feed them. This was how Jesus called out and trained his disciples. And all of it was obedience. And here's here's what I believe happened. This is Michael Maynard, Cliff Notes, because I've only got so much time. Cliff Notes, here it goes. Do this, and they did it. Do this, and they did it. Do this. And they did it. And the lessons would come. And somewhere along the way, and some of them, it wasn't even at the ascension yet, but somewhere along the way, they became believers. They realized that Jesus was right and everything else is broken. So they, they obeyed and they obeyed and they followed. And then at some point, they believed And at that point, their belief was so strong that it changed the world. 
And they went out not making converts. By the way, I looked up in the New Living, I just searched convert in the New Living Translation. There's only one time Jesus used it, and it was not good. Not good. He said, make disciples. And so these disciples made disciples and taught them to obey Jesus. And that was how it worked, and that's what they did. But then not all of them did. So here's the thing. I think you start following Jesus, and you start doing what he says, and some people believe and make other disciples, and some people just leave. That's what Judas did. I, I'm not particularly okay with that, but that's a reality. It's what it is. So Jesus looked for those obedient, and then he began to train them. So all that being said, I'll come into our, the point. I really only have one point today. What if we just obeyed Jesus? What if we just did what he said? You remember this passage, Matthew 7, 24. I'm just reading the uh, summary verses. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on the sand. So let's apply this. First of all, let's talk about your Bible. Mine's on my iPad here. The over 40 iPad. <laughs> let's talk about reading your Bible. Why do you read your Bible? Do you read it just so you can learn? Do you read it just for information? It, it's like, it's like the, the farmer that, that brought in the, the student from the college one year to, uh, to help him out, and the student was learning all these ag principles and all these kind of things. And, and the, he was trying to help the farmer make his farm more efficient and grow better crops. And he was giving him all these tips, this young guy. And you know how old crotchety farmers are. And if you don't, they're old and crotchety. So, you know. <laughs> that old farmer looked at that young man and said, listen here, son. I don't farm half as good as I know how to already. And sometimes that's how we are. We know so much and do so little. What if you change the way you read your Bible? For some of you, I don't mean this as a slap. But for some of you, you're not reading your Bible, and I'm telling you, it's your lifeline to God. I don't know how you know what God's doing and leading you into your life if you're not in his word. But that aside, when you get in his word, do not read it for information. Read it to hear the voice of God. Read it to hear from God. Don't read it because you're guilty. Don't read it because of a feeling. Just get to know the God who's writing to you who's speaking to you who's because it's the word of God he's speaking through it to you it's the living word if you approach the word of God like this you get up in the morning or before you go to bed at night how, whatever your routine is and it I have to do things in the morning because my brain um, ADD and it flies around all the rest of the day so I have to get in the word early what if we get into it and we say okay okay father what do you want to do today what do you want me to do not what have you got for me? I mean, yeah, there is, yes, fresh bread in the word, that's for sure. I'm just saying, what if you approach and say, okay, Lord, I guess, let me ask it this way. When is the last time you read the Bible and it changed your day? Start there. What if we were just obedient to what we read to the word of God? What if we didn't just ascend, didn't just accept what we read, but we actually practiced it? We actually did what he said. And it began simply. Jesus said to be baptized. Okay? It, he said to be back. It's the first act of obedience. It's the first thing that says, I am a follower of Christ, and I want everyone who cares to know to know it. I, I am dead to my old life, and now the life of Christ empowers me and, and until I get home and I put on the, the new thing that he has for me that I don't quite understand that, but I know it's going to be awesome. What if we did that? So if you haven't been baptized, what if you did that? What, what, he also told us to like obey his commandments. When's the last time you read your Bible and said, what were Jesus' commandments? What, what did Jesus tell us to do? You know, those are important. You know, like the love your enemies thing and, and the praying in your prayer closet, your Sermon on the Mount. I, I know you're going to read that stuff and go, but I can't do that. I know, you're, he's teaching you to walk on water. He's not teaching you how to live a happy life with Jesus as your co-pilot. He's teaching you how to live in a totally different kingdom than the one you were born into. 
And so, yes, it's challenging. And, and remember what I said? Here it is. You take a step. Jesus said, do this. He said, I'm sorry, I'm picking on those who are struggling with forgiveness. I don't mean to. <clears throat> but he told me to forgive somebody. You take a step out. And you, and you forgive. And then you focus on Jesus. And you get all stressed about it again tomorrow morning. And you take another step out of it. And you find out that there's power in Jesus to help you obey Jesus Christ. You know, back to the story of Peter walking on the water. Do you remember what happened when, when Peter sank? I think it's interesting. I really think it's interesting. Peter gets his eyes on the storm. The storm doesn't calm down just because he's walking on it. Gets his eyes on the storm, starts to sink. Jesus, like, immediately catches him. My lifeguard walks on water. Anyway, Jesus immediately catches him. The Bible says, Matthew 14, 31, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Now, now what? Now, here's what we think. I mean, if it had been me, <laughs> if I were Jesus, and of course, that's never going to happen, but I mean, other than him through me, but if I were Jesus, I'd be like, and it were one of my kids especially, and I had to catch them. It would not have been what Jesus said. It would have been something like, oh, you stink at walking on water. <laughs> That's where I'd have come from. You're not very good at this, are you? Ridiculous. <laughs> you're like, Michael, you're a nut. It's true. <laughs> I, I'm just, I wouldn't have done what Jesus did. But what did Jesus do? Jesus grabs him, he catches him, he saves him, and he says to him, I have so little faith. It's like there's heartbreak in it. I mean, that's how I'm hearing it in my heart, you know? It's like there's heartbreak in it. You have so little faith. Why, listen to this, why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me? That two-letter word changes everything, doesn't it? Because everybody... Everybody's willing to talk about faith in the world today. Yes, I have faith. So I will tell you the Christian perspective. Here it goes. Unless your faith is in Jesus, it's not actually faith. It's something else entirely. It's not faith. And so Jesus said, why did you doubt me? And what happened? Jesus, here's what, get into Peter's heart for a minute. He's walking on the storm. The storm doesn't calm down. Everything is crazy. The disciples are in the boat, cowering, getting wet. He's out on the way, the waves cowering, going, this is cool, but I'm scared. This is cool, but I'm scared. And all of a sudden, the storm was bigger to him than the Jesus who was in front of him. All of a sudden, Jesus wasn't enough for the situation, and nothing changed about Jesus. You understand that? Nothing changed about Jesus. He, he's in the same place, saying the same things, loving Peter the same way. Nothing in Jesus ever changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But something in Peter changed. And in Peter, he began to doubt Jesus. My friends, when we talk about obeying Jesus, we're talking about faith. We're talking about trusting, one, that Jesus is enough for any situation, especially the one I'm in right now, whether it's COVID-19 or not enough money to pay the bills or marital problems, stress at work, whatever it is, Jesus is enough for this. He's enough. And the more I focus on him, concentrate on him, begin to turn to him, and the less I need the storm to calm down. By the way, what's cooler, walking on a raging sea or a glassy one? And you're like, I'll walk on either one. But I think the raging sea's cooler. I mean, I don't know if God thought, you know, it's like, oh, this will be cool. I, sometimes I think God thinks that. <laughs> this will be cool. I'll have my son walk on water. I'll have him dead for three days and blow the doors off. It'll be great. <laughs> Jesus told us to trust him and to obey him. And obedience is simply about trust. He told us to pray. He told us to pray. Man, that's hard, isn't it? Isn't it hard to pray? Isn't it hard to pray when you have problems? I don't know how you are. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm the only one. It's okay if I'm the only one. 
And, and, and it's like this. I have this big, hairy problem, not enough money, not enough time, marital conflict, whatever it is, big, hairy problem. And I'm like, here's what I'm doing. I could pray, which is kind of like doing nothing. That's what I think. I could pray, or I could, I could work on it. I could figure it out. I can figure this out. And that's worked so well for me in the past. No. Jesus said pray because what's happening in the natural is being changed by and formed by what's happening in the supernatural. Jesus said come into the throne room. We talked about it last week. You want to change your world, you start at the head office. You go to the mission control where Jesus invited you in Hebrews and, and you go there. And then also, and this is critical to where we began, he told us to go and make disciples. Us. You know what I think the answer is, the simple answer for the Christian church in the world today, I think the simple answer is you and me. I think it's us. I, I think we need to get that whole, I'm not qualified, I don't know what to do. I think we need to get it out of our heads. We don't need professionals. We need obedient disciples. You do know that of the disciples, they were like rednecks. They were Jewish rednecks, okay? Well, a couple of them weren't, but most of them. They, they were kind of crass guys, which is why Peter had a big mouth. It's not about what you know. It's about whether or not you'll go. It's about, it's about being friends with people. Great epiphany I had last year. Discipleship begins with friendship. What, how would it change your life? How would it change your life if you began to live, if I began to live, not for more information and more knowledge, but if I began to live for more obedience? What if I began to look at God's word and say, well, Jesus said this is what I should do. I know I can't do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to step out in the raging sea with no power whatsoever to hold myself up on water and see what God does. What, would that, how would that change your life? How many of you have situations in right now, absolutely untenable, you have no way to fix them, you have no idea what to do, and, and instead of going, God, God, please calm the storm, and God's out on the storm going, no, I want you to walk on the storm. I want you to come to me. And what if you got in the word, instead of looking for that sermon to give to the person who's hurting your feelings, because that's what we do, right? We do that with sermons, right? Oh, man, I heard a sermon today. You really should listen. It was more for you than me. What if we, instead of doing that, we went to the Father and said, God, show me what to obey and give me the faith to step out into what I cannot do. This is what being filled with the Holy Spirit's about. It's emp it empowers us to do what we cannot do. And you know what's going to happen? If you're growing as a Christian, that also means you're failing as in, in many ways. There is no growth without failure. So if you guys are feeling like failures, if you came to church today going, I am, I'm a failure, my faith stinks, you're in a great place. You're good. It's okay, because here's what happens when you wipe out. Just like Peter takes the step out, begins to sink, Jesus catches you, and he looks at you and says, ah, where is your faith? He doesn't say you really stink at walking on water. He doesn't say you really, you, you really are terrible at overcoming the sins in your life. He doesn't say that at all. He says, why did, why did you doubt me? That's what he says. Why does he say that? To make you feel bad for doubting him? No, he says that to focus you, up, focus you upon him. To make you look at him. Tell you what, when Peter sank and Jesus caught him, who do you think had all of Peter's attention at that moment? Jesus. Peter didn't care about the storm at that moment because the anchor in the storm, the unshakable one, had him. That storm just shows you how shakable and short-sighted life is. And that's why Jesus can walk on storms, because the last thing he is is shakable. He's an anchor that pierces the veil and is lodged in the very throne room of heaven, and he's what holds you steady. And so think about this and begin to come 
into your Christian life as a practice and a journey into obedience and just doing what Jesus Christ said. Let's, learning's good, but do, doing is powerful. Let me finish up with these four questions and then I'll be done. Worship team, if you want to go ahead and come up, that's probably a good idea. I want to invite you to start getting into God's Word and to ask of it four questions. You can write these down. You can grab the slide that's available on the, the bulletin link that was posted somewhere last night that I can't remember where to tell you it is right now, but anyway, we'll share it. But why don't you read the Word of God, like the Great Commission that we just read, and begin to ask these questions. First, what does it teach us about God? For example, the Great Commission, you see that God has a heart for the whole world. And then he wants you, us, he wants to reach them through us. What if you be, then ask the second question, what does it teach us about people? We could get into the Word and find out that, that and, and people need God. They don't know what to do. And then what if, here's the, here's the transition. What does it teach us about God? What does it teach us about people? But then, what do I need to do about it? I mean, if, if God said this to me, and I believe that when you're reading the word, you're reading what God is saying to you, and he's actually speaking it to you in that moment. And you begin to say, if, 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 if God said this, what should I do about it? And then last, what if, the fourth question, what if you begin to ask, okay, I know something about God now. I know a little bit more about people. I know what I should do about it. I think I should share it with somebody else. Because Jesus said, make disciples. Teach them to obey. Four simple questions. I'm asking you to apply them this very week. Your Bible reading in the morning. Your family, maybe your family gathers to talk about this message. What a great day to talk to your children about obedience, huh? All the parents in the room, okay. You'll have that conversation a lot. It's good. It's okay. Have that conversation. Begin to answer these questions and begin to move forward. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have not left us. Left us. You have not left us alone. You said you'd be with us to the end of the age. You haven't. You're, you're speaking all the time. You're, you're like a chatterbox. You never stop. I stop listening, but you never stop speaking. I ask, Lord, that you speak to your church today. You speak to believers today. That you, you make us followers and believers who make disciples. That you would help us to, to stop pushing off our responsibilities, the things you call us to do, and help us to walk into those. And I pray for the people that are in this room facing the impossible. I, yeah, I know the whole world has got stuff going on, Lord, and I know the COVID-19 thing, and, and that's serious, but, but some people are really overwhelmed by that, and some people are overwhelmed by more closer problems, by problems that are much closer than that. And they're looking at this storm, and they're terrified in the boat, and they're terrified of the sea, and they don't know what to do. And somehow today, they need to hear from you for that step. So, Father, speak in a way that they can hear and encourage them to take a step and know Christ followers walk on water. It's what we do. Help them to be the storm walkers in Jesus' name. Amen.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful for the day. Lord, this is the day that you've made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And Lord, thank you to, for us to be able to be gathered in a room, Lord. And Lord, being able to smile, being able to touch, Lord, just be able to, to be together once again. And Lord, I pray that as Pastor Michael preached, God, I pray, Heavenly Father, that we will be obedient to the Word, that we'll be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you will direct our lives, and we'll be obedient even to the death of picking up our cross every day and following you, even if that means death. God, I pray, Heavenly Father, today that you just, you prepare us as the church to do your good works. I pray, Heavenly Father, we take the advantage and the opportunities to be able to share your love, to share your compassion. Lord, you are the great way maker. And Lord, we look for the victories that are going to follow. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day.